1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 1. Last week we left off with Paul talking about, uh, the whole chapter 8 was dealing with things being offered to idols, uh, food being offered to the idols there in those pagan temples in Corinth. Uh, of course, a very pagan community that were worshiping false gods and things. And so the question for Christians became, hey, uh, do I have the right to eat that food? Don't I have the right? I mean, uh, those idols are nothing. I can go ahead and partake in that food. And Paul said, well, sure, we all know that those idols are nothing, but uh, you have to be considering this idea that you may make a, a weaker brother or sister in Christ stumble if you eat of it. And so you see at the end of chapter 8 there in verse 13, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never again eat meat lest I make my brother stumble. And and so that's how he ended that chapter. And as you go into chapter 9, you might think he's totally changing the subject initially there. Uh, he, he's kind of uh, going in a different direction, but he's really hitting on that same point. I don't want to be a stumbling block. And so Uh, For my brothers and sisters, I will endure all things. And that's what I've entitled the message today, Endure All Things. And uh, and so as we begin here today, I just want to read a couple of verses uh, and then we'll get going with this. Am I not an apostle, Paul says? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? If I am not an apostle to others, yet doubtless I am to you. For you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. My defense to those who examine me, examine me in this, uh, do we have no right to eat and drink? Do we have no right to take along a believing wife as do, other, uh, as do also the other apostles, the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working? Whoever goes to war... Uh, at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and does not eat of its fruit? Or who tends a flock and does not drink of the milk of the flock? Do I say these things as a mere man? Or does not the law say the same also? For it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. Is it oxen God is concerned about? Or does he say it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he who plows should plow in hope, and he who threshes in hope should be partaker of of his hope. If we have sown spiritual things for you, is it a great thing that if we reap your material things? If others are partakers of this right over you, are we not even more? Nevertheless, and this is the key here, we have not used this right, but endure all things, lest we hinder the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that those who minister the holy things eat the things of the temple? And those who serve at the altar partake of the offerings of the altar? Even so, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should live from the gospel. But I have not, I have used none of these things, nor have I written these things that it should be done so to me, For it would be better for me to die than that anyone should make my boasting void. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word here today. And we do ask that you would just uh, open our hearts, open our eyes to see what Paul is saying here. And Lord, that we may apply it to our lives. That we also may uh, not stumble those around us, but build them up in their faith. We thank you in Jesus' name. All right. Well, again, it's, it's a difficult passage and, uh, you know, we've read quite a few verses here, and, and it's, you need to get the context of, of what's going on here. Uh, I'll never eat meat again if it makes my brother stumble, even though it's a right that I certainly have. And so what Paul is beginning to say now in chapter 9 is that, hey, I'm an apostle. Uh, you know, I, I, have, I have the right to do many things, but I'm not going to do those things because it will hinder the gospel of Jesus Christ. I will endure uh, the disrespect that the church in Corinth, they're a bunch of carnal Christians. They don't respect Paul the way that they should. They don't honor him in the way that they should. Uh, In fact, they show disrespect towards him. And and so what he's saying here, I'll, I'll endure those things. Yes, I have the right to do a great many things, but I won't do those things uh, because I don't want to hinder 
the gospel of Jesus Christ going out in this community. And so I'll refrain from my rights and I'll endure uh, whatever I need to endure as a result. John F. Kennedy in his inaugural address in uh, 1961, very, very famous speech, but he says there at the beginning, in your hands, my fellow citizens, more than in mine will rest the final success or failure of this course. And this is after he's kind of laid out what he would like his administration to be all about. Since this country was founded, each generation of Americans has been summoned to give testimony to its national loyalty. The graves of young Americans who answered the call to service surround the globe. And so he's talking about this sacrifice that needs to be made for our nation, for our nation to remain strong, for our nation to remain a, a, a good, strong nation around the world. The graves of young Americans lie everywhere around the globe to maintain that. There's had to have been a sacrifice. But as he goes on in that, you know, I, one of the things I really admire about John F. Kennedy is he's not just a politician saying these things. He was there. In World War II, he was the commander of a PT boat and he saw a lot of action. He was right there in the thick of it. Many of his friends and, and um, guys that served with him there were killed. Uh, he endured extreme sacrifice in some of the things that he had to do, some of the missions, and they're very famous, and you can read about them. I'm not going to go into that. But it was with that kind of idea and that kind of experience that he came forth with the next line. And, of course, it's very famous. My fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. And, you know, it's so well known, it's, it's cliche, but how powerful is that statement? Don't worry about your rights. Don't say, give me, give me, give me. It's my right. It's my freedom. And you need to give it to me. And I'm going to demand it from you. Don't ask what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. How can you serve your country? My fellow citizens of the world, he goes on, ask not what America will do for you, but what together we can do for the freedom of man. What can we do for our fellow man? Stop asking and stop making the statements of it's my right, it's my entitlement and how far we've come from that. Truly in America we have become a nation of, uh, you know, entitlements and it's my right and you've got to give it to me and and not that heart that he was trying to, to get out there to everybody. Ask not what your country can do for you. What can you do for your country? And this is not an original thought that John F. Kennedy had, certainly. I mean, what he's saying here comes right from the pages that we're reading right now. Ask not what the Lord can do for you and what the church can do for you, but what you can do for the Lord and what you can do for those members of the body of Christ that are here in the church. Instead of demanding what my rights are and and saying, look, it's my right, it's my freedom, I have the liberty to do these things in the Lord, and you just got to deal with it. No, rather, you say, as Paul said, to not hinder the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'll refrain from my own rights. I'll endure not being able to have the freedoms that I think I deserve so that my weaker brothers and sisters in Christ will not be stumbled and so that the gospel of Jesus Christ is not hindered and it's able to go forth and uh, be fruitful. And just finishing his speech here, he says, finally, whether you are citizens of America or citizens of the world, ask of us the same high standards of strength and sacrifice which we ask of you. With a good conscience, our only sure reward with history, the final judge of our deeds. And that's not true. I don't agree with that. History is not the final judge of our deeds, is it? The Lord is. But he says, let us go forth and lead the land we love, asking his blessing And his help, but knowing that here on earth, God's work must truly be our own. And I thought that was very powerful. God's work on earth must become our own. And as we go out and we do that work, we can get in the way of God using us. Asking his blessing and his help. Truly, the the things that we're talking about here today, sacrificing ourselves. Uh, setting ourselves aside so that others may be built up in the Lord. It's not a natural reaction. We're a nation of entitlements and rights and freedoms because 
the natural tendency of man is to demand his own rights and to look out for number one. And hey, I, don't step on my rights. Don't step on my uh, abilities and my freedoms and my liberties. You've got to let me do what I want to do. It's, that's the natural way. But certainly we need his help to overcome that and so that we may be a blessing to others. God's work must become our own. But unfortunately, within the church, within Christianity, uh, we, we tend to give the church a black eye, don't we? And just like the Pharisees and the scribes, uh, it's all about me. And it's all about you know, my uh, status symbol in front of people. And it's all about what I want to accomplish. It's all about my interpretation of things. And as a result, we keep those who might come into the kingdom of God from coming because we turn them away. In Luke 11, Jesus said, Woe to you, lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You did not enter yourselves, and those who were entering in, you hindered. You hindered the gospel. You hindered the good news, the grace of God being poured out on mankind because of your self-righteousness. The lawyers, the scribes, they knew the Bible. They knew it well. And they wrote books and books and books about what the Bible was all about. And they chopped it up and they diced it and they, they you know, left things out and they did all kinds of things to the Bible. Of course, God's Word is the key to the kingdom of God. It gives you the knowledge and the wisdom that you need to cry out to God and to see what He wants you to do in your life. But those lawyers, they, they messed it up so much and they, they twisted it and, and uh, just manipulated it so much that they took away that key from the minds and the hearts of people there. Jesus said, you didn't enter in yourself and those who were trying to go in, those who were coming to the temple and coming to the synagogues, you hindered them. You got in the way. You became a stumbling block to them because of your rights and because of what you wanted to do. It's very sad. I found this poem very interesting. Isn't it strange that princes and kings and clowns that caper in sawdust rings and common folk like you and me are the builders of eternity? To each is given a bag of tools, a shapeless mass, and a book of rules. And each must make, ere time is flown, a stumbling block or a stepping stone. Each one of us can become one or the other. Each one of us can become a stumbling block. We're kind of a shapeless mass when we come in as a new believer. All we know is, I was once lost, but now I'm found. I was once blind, but now I can see. And, you know, there's a process that God wants to do in our hearts. He wants to sanctify us. He wants to change us. He wants to build us. And He wants to use the other people here in the fellowship to do that, to help us put aside those selfish ways, to help us put aside those carnal appetites and to mold us and to shape us into a stepping stone that others can use to get to that same place, into that deeper relationship with Jesus Christ. But if we want to hang on to our rights, if we want to hang on to this is mine and this is what I can do and this is my liberty, this is my freedom, then we're going to become a a stumbling block to the others around us. And we're going to hinder what God wants to do in their life. We're going to hinder their growth. And they might even just shake their heads and go, man, those Christians, they're just a bunch of carnal, self-absorbed hypocrites. I don't want to have anything to do with it. And they walk away. They're hindered by it. Let that not be said of us. Let that be said of, of Calvary Chapel Eureka. They're a bunch of stepping stones over there. Boy, they're just helping me. They're helping me take that next step. They're helping me come up to that next level. They're helping me get grounded in God's Word and in His truth. They're helping me put aside all this baggage that I have in my life. They're helping me. They're stepping stones. They're not making me stumble. Let that be said of us. And so as we go back over this and look at a couple things here, uh, two things that we can look at that are very simple. Stumbling blocks and stepping stones. And so Paul, again, in in verse 1 there, he begins to talk about the fact that he has rights as an apostle, even though they're not really being recognized 
uh, by, their, by the congregation there. He says, am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Uh, look, I've got liberty. Don't I have liberty to do the things that we're talking about here? I have that liberty. Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? If I am not an apostle to others, yet doubtless I'm, I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. I have freedom. I can do a great many things, Paul says. I've seen the Lord. I've had an encounter with the Lord and He has revealed deep spiritual truths to me. He has given me uh, gifts. He's given me the office of being an apostle. And and so Paul certainly has that ability to uh, reveal truth to us. The vast majority of the New Testament is written by this man that we're talking about. And certainly his apostleship was very clear. It's very clear to us now. But to a carnal group of believers who are saying, oh, we're of Paul, we're of Apollos, and hey, we still like to be involved in the world, and we still like to engage in these carnal appetites, and we still like to do all the stuff that the world is doing, they couldn't see Paul in that light. They couldn't see the truth that he was bringing forth. And they didn't recognize him in that way. And much is said about Paul questions about his authority, questions about whether he really is an apostle. And you see that quite a bit in in 2 Corinthians. When he writes the second letter to them, he talks about it in great detail, about their lack of uh, accepting him as a true apostle. He wasn't one of the 12 disciples of Jesus Christ, and maybe that was a big problem for them. But in 2 Corinthians 10, he says, Even if I should boast somewhat more about our authority, which the Lord gave us for edification and not for your destruction, the Lord has given us this ability to build you up. And that's what the authority is about. It's not that we're on a a, a power trip. God has given this ability to us to build you up in your faith, to become a stepping stone to you and to help you. After going through a long list of things that Paul has endured as an apostle in chapter 11. If you read chapter 11, is when he goes through there and he said, look, I was shipwrecked. I spent a couple nights in the ocean. Uh, you know, I've been beaten. I've been stoned to death. I've gone through all this stuff. You know, but isn't that enough is kind of what he's saying. He's not really bragging, hey, man, I'm, I'm the man. You know, I've done all this stuff. He wasn't bragging like that. He was, he was just saying, look, if you say these guys over here are apostles, uh, look at the things the Lord has done in me and through me. Certainly I'm an apostle. If I'm not an apostle to others, certainly I'm to you. Uh, there was no church here in Corinth before I arrived, Paul is basically saying. And when I left, there was a big church. And so certainly I was used by the Lord to establish the very church that you guys are now members of. And so, you know, again, he he says there, I have become a fool in boasting in chapter uh, 12. You have compelled me, for I ought to have been commended by you, for in nothing was I behind the most eminent of apostles, but then you see his humility there, though I am nothing. I haven't taken a back seat to any of those other apostles, even the most eminent ones. And he even mentions Cephas there and the brothers of the Lord. But I'm nothing. It's not that I'm bragging about myself. I'm nothing. But still, God has used me in that way. And he's he's using me now to correct you in your sin. Correct you in your misunderstanding about how the body of Christ should function. Chapter 13, he goes on. Since you seek a proof of Christ speaking in me, who is not weak towards you, but mighty in you. They wanted proof. Come on, Paul, show us a sign. Show us a sign that you're really, truly an apostle. So we'll listen to you. That's kind of the idea. Well, one of the reasons, again, uh, if you flip on back over to Acts, hold your place there for just a minute. Acts chapter 1, we get a bit of an idea of of why the questions about Paul's authority might have been there. Uh, There was a need to replace Judas. Judas, of course, betrayed Christ and and died. And and so uh, Peter rose up in verse 15. He says, hey, uh, we need to find another disciple. 
somebody that was with us here the whole time the Lord was around and, and somebody that, uh, you know, is, is a true brother in Christ, you know. And so in verse 21, after he quoted a, a verse from the Old Testament about let another take his office, Paul says, therefore, of these men who have a, accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John to that day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. And they proposed two, Joseph called Barsabas, who was surnamed Justice and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, O Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which of these two you have chosen. And so Matthias was chosen as that 12th apostle to replace Judas. But you know what? That's the last time you ever hear the name Matthias in the Bible. He, maybe he did do good works and maybe he did go on to be a good apostle. We don't know. We just never hear anything else about him. But what's interesting about this passage here, it's at the end of chapter 1. And what happens in chapter 2? The Holy Spirit is poured out upon the church. They didn't have the Holy Spirit helping to make that decision there evidently because it's very evident that Paul became that 12th apostle. He became that apostle. And so there might have been questions in the mind. Hey, Paul wasn't here when, when John was baptized. He was persecuting the church at that time. He was trying to wipe the church out. He was not with us when the Lord was walking this earth for three and a half years. He was against us. And so there might have been that question there. But certainly Paul did see the Lord. Saw him on the road to Damascus. He spent three years just being taught by the Lord in Arabia. Paul understood that question was lingering out there, though. Later on, we'll find in chapter 15, last of all, Paul says, he was seen by me also as one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church. Paul says, I admit it. I, I'm not worthy to be called an apostle, but I am what I am. He will go on to say, I am what I am and God has used me. God's grace has been poured out upon me. He's given me this gift. He's given me this calling. He, he knocked me off my horse on that road and shined that light into my eyes and blinded me and said, I'm going to send you out and you're going to suffer a great many things for my name's sake. And so I answered the call. I am what I am. I'm not even worthy. I did persecute the church. It's right. But God has called me to this ministry and that's what I'm doing. Well, the tragedy, again, within the church is that most of us don't have that kind of idea within our hearts of that selfless sacrifice that Paul understood so very well. And this poem kind of pictures that very well. The selfishness that we have. Our lives are completely engulfed in our lives, aren't they? Most of the time. It's a tea party for three I gave a little tea party this afternoon at three. T'was very small, three guests in all, I, myself, and me. Myself ate all the sandwiches while I drank all the tea. T'was also I that ate the pie and passed the cake to me. <laughs> what a picture of, of how we are. Our lives are just surrounded by me, myself, and I. And, and I got to have my rights. I've got to have my rights. I've got to be able to do the things that I want to do. But Paul takes a very different tact here in 1 Corinthians. You can flip on back over there if you haven't already. Paul says there in verse 4, Do we not have the right to eat and drink? Do we not have the right to take along a believing wife as also the other apostles, the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Hey, James and Peter get to have a wife. How come, how come I, you guys feel like I couldn't? <laughs> He's talked about the marriage thing quite a bit and, and talked about the celibacy that he feels like he's gifted to have. But you could see in what he's saying here that those questions are lingering out there against Paul. Or is it only I, or is it only Bar, uh, Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working? 
And now he begins to talk about the crux of, of what he's bringing up here. Working. Paul, when he was in Corinth, was working for his own uh, support. Because the church there, again, being carnal, uh, hey, we don't want to give you our money. You know, you're not a real apostle anyway. We're not going to pay to support you. And, and so Paul kind of got that feeling that they they weren't joyful in their giving enough to include Paul in that support, even though they were supporting others. And so that's what Paul's getting at here. It is, is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working? And, and so he begins to talk about whoever goes to war at his own expense. You know, I was in the military, went over to the, the Persian Gulf, and I can't imagine how much it would have cost for me to get on a plane, fly over there at my own expense, uh, pay for my own food and room and board and all that stuff for six months while I was over there during the Gulf War, and then fly back home after that at my own expense. And so that's what Paul is saying. Hey, are you going to send a soldier out and make him pay for his own way? He's doing a lot of work. He's sacrificing himself and he's uh, putting himself in grave danger. And it's only right to help him and to support him in that. It's kind of what he's getting at there. Who plants a vineyard and does not eat of its fruit? Or who tends a flock and does not drink of the milk of the flock? Very logical things that Paul's saying here. It, it only stands to reason that somebody who, who tends a flock or, or plants a, a garden or something is going to be able to eat from that garden, that garden and take care uh, as they take care of it. Paul says, this is not just coming from my, the top of my head here. That's what the Bible says. And so certainly that right is there. Do I say these things as a mere man or does not the law say the same also? For it is written in the law of Moses... You shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. Is it oxen God is concerned about, or does he say it all together for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, this was written, that he who plows should plow in hope, and he who threshes in hope should be partakers of his hope. The hope that there's going to be a harvest come in here. I'm going to sow this seed, I'm going to plow this field and and take care of this garden here in the hope that it's going to bring forth some food to sustain me and my family. And so that's the idea. It's not the point that Paul is trying to make that, hey, churches should pay for a pastor. Uh, it's, It's a given, really, that in the Bible, in the Old Testament, certainly the priests, they lived from the food that came in to the priesthood. As people would come in and offer their offerings as sacrifices for their sins and and for other things, uh, you know, there was a portion of that meat that was given to the priest to allow them to uh, be sustained. And so that's what he's bringing out. The law says that. It's a given. Now, what Paul is bringing into the church now, he says in verse 11, if we have sown spiritual things for you, is it a great thing if we reap your material things? If others are partakers of this right over you, are we not even... Oh, I'm sorry. I'm going too far there. Just that idea, though. How much is it worth to the congregation there is is kind of what Paul is bringing up. Within the church, it's the same thing. Uh, You know, there is an expectation a little bit that uh, a pastor should work for, for any kind of money, and it's very true. And, uh, you know, I worked for the first two years that I was here, and it was, it was very difficult. And, and I know as a, as a church began to grow and grow and grow, uh, it became increasingly harder to meet the needs of the congregation the bigger we got. And so there became a need for me to go full-time. Uh, could I do, uh, could I pastor the church and still work a full-time job? Well, yeah, I could, but it, the church would suffer as a result of that. And so, but Paul says, nevertheless, I've not taken that right. I haven't used that right that I had. The Bible says that I have that right. The Bible says that it's only natural for the apostle to kind of reap the material uh, uh, goods from the congregation for the spiritual uh, teaching that he's giving to them. But in a carnal church, as the one here in Corinth, They didn't see the value in it. 
they didn't see the value in what Paul was bringing. And so they didn't want to pay him. They didn't want to support him. And Paul got that sense. And so he said, okay, I'll just keep on working because I don't want to stumble you. If that's where you're at, I, I won't demand my rights. I won't force you to give me any money. I won't harp on it. And I'm not writing these things right now so that you will start paying me some money for the sake of the gospel so that I won't stumble anybody. I won't take that right is what Paul is saying there. Well, Paul is really presenting an incredible message here. Last week in chapter 8, talking about those things offered to idols, he's going to continue that thought on through chapter 10. And he will finish with this idea of of sacrificing to idols and what idols are, are all about. But early on, he began with that idea of all things are lawful for me. And now he was talking to the church about their carnal appetites. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. In my own personal life, yes, I have the right to do a lot of things, but they're not helpful for me. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Whether I can do it or not is not the the point. Is it going to hurt my walk with the Lord or is it going to help my walk with the Lord? whether I can take part in drinking alcohol or watching certain movies or going certain places or doing certain things, it's not the point. The point is, is it going to bring me into bondage? Is it going to take me back into the the works of the flesh? Or is it going to increase my walk with the Lord? Is it going to help my walk with Him? But then as he finishes this thought in chapter 10, he says, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. Let no one seek his own, but each one the other's well-being. Yes, I have the right as an apostle to take, uh, you know, to take the, the material things as, as payment for the work that I'm doing here in the city of Corinth. It's a right that's laid out in the Bible, but it's not necessarily going to build them up if they feel that, that I'm not worthy of it if they're in a place of being carnal and not understanding the true worth of of what we're doing here, if it stumbles them. And certainly it is a thing that does stumble a lot of people. Partially because people are carnal and they just don't see the the value in the preaching of the gospel. They don't see the value in in a pastor, pastoring a church and working full-time to do that. But in large part, it's because of carnal Christians who have given it a bad name, have given the church a black eye. And they go around driving around in, in big Cadillacs and, and big houses. And uh, their dogs have more expensive houses than the people in their congregations do. And, you know, we can talk about TV evangelists and, and some of the, the corruption that we've seen over the years as, as pastors have just, you know, fleeced their congregations to no end. And of course, that has brought about uh, a, a lot of questions in the, in the minds of people in congregations and in our society about, uh, you know, the corruption of pastors. You know, when I, when I meet people that are uh, probably not Christians or churchgoers, you know, they, when they find out I'm a pastor, uh, some of them give me a very dirty look like, oh, you're a corrupt you're probably molesting children and, and you probably live in a big mansion up on the hill and you're begging, for, begging your congregation for money. I mean, that's just how it's, how it's become uh, in our society because of the corruption of pastors. But certainly Paul was not one of those guys. Paul was not a, a guy that was bringing a stumbling block to trip people up and to hinder the gospel in his communities. How to be miserable, someone once wrote. Think about yourself. Talk about yourself. Use I as often as possible. Mirror yourself continually in the opinions of others. Listen greedily to what people say about you. Expect to be appreciated. Be suspicious. Be jealous and envious. Be sensitive to slights. Never give or forgive a criticism. Trust nobody but you. 
Insist on consideration and respect. Demand agreement with your own view on everything. Sulk if people are not grateful to you for favors shown them. Never forget a service you have rendered. Proclaim your rights forcefully. Do as little as possible for others. You're well on your way to being a very miserable person. I have to have my rights. That is the sign of a very, very carnal person. Maybe a Christian, but there's a lot of rough edges there that need to be trimmed off. And for each one of us, as we are looking at the things that Paul's saying here, we can say, well, that's just for pastors. That's just for apostles. That's just, no. Every one of us need to understand what Paul is saying here so that I don't stumble others. I need to be considering not my own rights, not what I want to do, not what my liberties are, not what my freedoms are, not what I'm justified in doing, but how is this going to affect others? Am I going to be a stumbling block to somebody or am I going to be a stepping stone for them to come up to a higher level than the one they're at now? That's a true consideration for us. Rather than viewing my rights, my freedoms, my liberties, the true child of God who is going to uh, you know, just be a person who is enduring all things. We're going to look at our walks with the Lord in more of a, this is my obligation to the Lord. I'm compelled to do these things for the Lord because of what He has done for me. I am compelled to serve the Lord by serving others. I am compelled to deny myself. I'm obligated because of what God has done for me, because of the extreme sacrifice that He has made for me. It's a compulsion. It's an obligation rather than concentrating on the the rights and the freedoms. Well, you see there in verse 12, and we've already looked at it a little bit, nevertheless, we have not used this right but endure all things lest we hinder the gospel. Do you not know that those who minister the holy things eat of the things of the temple and those who serve at the altar partake of the offerings of the altar? Even so, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should live from the gospel. But the idea here is there's a caveat. The the gospel, those who preach the gospel should live from the gospel unless unless it stumbles the people within the congregation. Unless it's a huge stumbling block, then the pastor should not receive that salary, is what Paul is saying here, what I clearly see. Unless it's going to stumble people, if people are really going to have a hard time with it, until we can kind of work through that issue and that not be something that's going to keep the gospel from going forward and people coming to know the Lord, then we just won't do it. I'll go get a job and, and, and I'll just do that job. It's kind of the idea there. The Lord has commanded it. But if it stumbles people, we won't do it. Verse 15, But I have used none of these things, nor have I written these things, that it should be done so to me. For it would be better for me to die than anyone should make my boasting void. I would rather die, Paul says, than make people stumble, is essentially what he's saying here. I would rather die than have my rights, my freedoms, and my liberties make people stumble and hinder what God wants to do in their life, is exactly what he's saying here. And that is the kind of self-sacrificing life that God has called each one of us to. Not just Paul, not just pastors, not just apostles. Each one of us. And so first of all, I think we're compelled by God's love. It's not our own love for other people because we just, we can't deal with that. (laughs) If you're going to serve people because you have a love for them, that's going to run out real quick. It really is. I mean, you try to serve people in the power of your own emotions and love for them, uh, you're going to wind up just really burning out very quickly but because of how much God loves them. God so loved the whole world that he let his son come down here for 33 years and die so that we may be saved. That's the kind of self-sacrificing love that he's all about. He has a great love 
for all of mankind. And he wants to see all of mankind come to a place of knowing him and accepting him. And you and I have no right to get in the way of that. We have no right to become a stumbling stone to trip people up as we're standing there saying, well, it's my right to do this. No way. No way. We're compelled by God's love for all of mankind. We're compelled to see that gospel go forward and that's really just the ultimate outworking of His love. To see all of mankind saved, God does not desire that anyone should perish, but that all come to repentance. We are compelled in many ways. But the hypocrites, the Pharisees, the scribes were not compelled in that way. They were compelled to have people come and say, oh, wow, that was just such a great message you said and those long prayers that you say are just awesome and you're so spiritual and just love the long robes you're wearing and oh, you're just holy and oh, here, go ahead. You know, they love those greetings in the marketplace. Oh, hello, rabbi. You know, and all all those kind of things. It was all about them. What did they do? Jesus said to them, woe to you, you're a hypocrite. For you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For you neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. Because of your hypocrisy, because of your self-righteousness, you hinder the work that God wants to do. And so rather than that, we need to be compelled by a sense of humility, a sense of thankfulness for what God has done for us. He saved a wretch like me. And he saved a wretch like you as well. He took you out of that muck and mire that you were in and he shined the light of his truth into your eyes and you had a sense that for the first time in your life all your sins, all your guilt, all your failures were forgiven. And there's no amount of money to equal that. Is it worth it? Paul says, certainly it's worth it, but I won't take that right because I don't want to stumble you from having a sense of the forgiveness of your own sins, having a sense of a relationship with your maker. And once you come to that place, once you come to that place of understanding how much it's worth, I know that eventually you'll want to support not only me, but all these other apostles. You'll want to send money down to... Jerusalem and help those poor people down there and you'll want to give of your material goods so you can see the gospel of Jesus Christ go out and not be hindered. Humility and thankfulness. We're obligated to serve and endure. It's the life of sacrifice. Obligated because we need to be a living sacrifice and of course this verse that we talk about so often but it's so right on. Paul, again in Romans, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. It's only reasonable because of what he has done for us to in turn become a living sacrifice, just as Jesus did. We're obligated to edify others. We're obligated to become a stepping stone. It's, it's not something that, well, yeah, I can do that, I guess, maybe some point down the road. I mean, that's what God is calling each one of us to do, to deny ourselves, to get over ourselves and get on with the work of the Lord that he wants to do in every life in this room. Again, we can become a stumbling block in a lot of different ways, or we can become a stepping stone. Which one are you right now? Which one do you want to become? Ask yourself that. And then as you consider that question, consider this, and this is the last verse we'll cover and we'll close. Jesus, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. That's what he said to the disciples, you come and follow me. You come and follow me. 
Put yourself behind. Come and follow me. Deny yourself. Pick up your cross. Let's go. Oh, but I got all these rights and all these freedoms and I got to go take care of my dad and I got to go take care of this property and I got to do this and I got to do that. Well, don't follow me then. If all that stuff is more important to you than the gospel of Jesus Christ, then you're not worthy to be one of my disciples. Put that stuff away. Come and follow me. That's what Jesus says to each one of us here today. Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth, Lord, and we thank you that your Holy Spirit is here with us and is able to give us the power to do these things because we admit and we confess, Lord, that we have no ability to love people the way that you love them. We have no ability to uh, prefer their needs and wants and um, desires above our own for the sake of the gospel. But Lord, we know through your word and through your promises that that you promise us that you will give us that power and that ability to carry out the work that you've called us to. And so here today, Lord, we ask that you would fill us again before we walk out these doors. Fill us with the power of your spirit to do the things that we've discussed.